Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about lesser toe uh, maladies. Um, so this is going to go through mallet toe, claw toe, hammer toe, plantar plate disruption, and metatarsalgia. Um, hopefully you guys were able to do the reading for this talk. Um, and in addition, um, the seventh chapter of Man and Coughlin's uh, Surgery of the Foot and Ankle will be really helpful, and most of the images I'm using for this talk are coming from there. All right, so a little bit about the anatomy. You know, similar to the finger, um, you have the intrinsics and the extrinsics that are playing a part, as well as the collaterals uh, around um, the joints themselves, and in addition, the plantar plate um, on the underside of especially the metatarsal phalangeal joint. Um, if you look at this view here, you can kind of see the toe from the bottom um, and how the intrinsics and extrinsics play a role. And then if you look on this kind of slide to the right, this is kind of the more important one. What you can see is that typically if the EDL contracts, you're going to get an extension at that MTPJ. Um, and if the FDL contracts, you're going to get contracture at the proximal interphalangeal joint and the distal interphalangeal joint. And it's really the intrinsics that help to um, plantar flex the um, MTPJ and as well as dorsiflex and straighten the PIPJ and the DIPJ. Um, and that really becomes important when we're talking about the pathophysiology um, and what happens for these patients. So hammer, claw, and mallet. Very uh, ortho sounding. So distinguishing them. So in reality, we, we treat them all fairly similarly, uh, but it is important to know uh, the difference just in kind of understanding what is going on. So with the hammer toe, you have flexion at the PIP. It's normal at the PIP. And with a mallet toe, um, you have flexion at the DIP, normal at the PIP. And with a claw toe, you have flexion at both the DIP and the PIP. Um, all of these will typically be met with extension at the MTPJ. Um, however, oftentimes mallet toes are not. Mallet toes will be for, fairly straight with just that flexion at the DIP, and that is part of what can kind of cause um, their further issues. Um, some rare deformities that we talk about a lot more in the hand, but we do actually see um, in the foot and the toes are the boutonniere deformity and the swan neck deformity, totally similar as this is very uh, analogous anatomy um, in the foot as it is to the hand. For the boutonniere deformity, you get a rupture of that central extensor slip. It's traumatic usually, so you get flexion of the DIP and hyperextent, sorry, flexion of the PIP and hyperextension of the DIP. And for the swan neck, you get that flexion of the DIP with hyperextension of the PIP. Again, these are very rare, but certainly possible to see. So in terms of the etiology and pathophysiology, the pathophysiology oftentimes will be arthritis. It can be degenerative changes at the plantar plate or the collaterals, um, or it could be an imbalance of the intrinsics and the extrinsics. There are certain anatomic variations among patients that may predispose one patient to one type versus another. Um, and definitely shoe wear plays a part. The, all of these are really rarely seen in populations that do not wear shoes. Um, there's always the big question about whether or not shoes cause any difference in flat foot or cavus foot. And the answer is probably not, but they do seem to have an effect on lesser toe deformities especially. Um, neuromuscular disorders um, can play a role too, especially in that imbalance of the intrinsics and the intrinsics, and degenerative changes over time, certainly. Um, here you can see this uh, graphic kind of representing what happens when we are in a narrow toe box shoe. You can see how um, all that nice room you have when you're barefoot gets, uh, gets closed off um, and everything gets kind of crammed together into the front. And that is where a lot of people think that um, this pathology and pathophysiology comes from. For the mallet, the claw, and the hammer toe, um, older women appear to be the most affected. You can see on this graph that the solid blue line is women, and it tends to affect women about four to one compared to men. For men, it tends to kind of stay the same throughout uh, the ages, but for women, there's a big spike um, as women enter that fifth, sixth, and seventh decade of life. 
And so the symptoms of this is pain. It's usually rubbing over the prominent areas, either onto shoes or other toes. Difficulty with shoe wear, again, rubbing over those prominent areas. Um, sometimes you can't even get infection if the areas of pressure actually ulcerate. Um, and this is a big consideration in people that are insensate and are neuropathic, so especially diabetics. Um, uh, we see this a lot, I'm sure. You guys have seen this uh, at the county hospital. We see it in our clinics all the time. And even for patients who aren't in, um, neuropathic, you can certainly get an ulceration that causes an infection in this area as well. So in physical examination, the probably the most important thing you want to understand is, is the toe able to be manually straightened? Thus, is it flexible or is it rigid? Flexible versus inflexible. Um, and it is important to see someone stand to understand toe position during weight bearing. And that's because as the extrinsic muscles um, and other things kind of play a role in this deformity, someone who is relatively flexible when sitting sometimes can be almost completely rigid while standing due to a severe contracture of one of the intrinsic tendons. Um, and so it's important for you to see that. Um, and you should also examine for areas of callus and ulcerations. Don't, and don't forget to check in between the toes because sometimes they can exist there as well. And treatment wise, um, treatment really should be based upon the symptoms. It's usually to decrease pain and improve the fit in the shoes. Um, and this is usually non-operative to start and especially for flexible um, deformities. Flexible deformities, as you might imagine, uh, tend to be less symptomatic, they tend to be less painful, they tend to give less rubbing because they will tend to almost auto-correct themselves once in inside a shoe. Um, but even for inflexible or rigid deformities, starting with non-operative treatment is very reasonable and for a lot of people, the vast majority of people, um, that will be um, effective and you can avoid um, surgery. For surgical treatment, it is really very dependent on flexible versus having a fixed deformity. Um, a lot of the treatments we use are fairly similar, whether they're hammer toe, claw toe, or mallet toe. Um, but it is kind of important to understand exactly where that deformity is coming from, which joints are flexible and which joints are inflexible. Um, and these really can be done in conjunction with other procedures around the foot and ankle. Um, so as you can see here, probably the mainstay of our flexible deformity um, would be either a ten tenotomy or a tendon transfer. Um, the Girlstone, tendon tran Girlstone Taylor tendon transfer is a classically described tendon transfer that admittedly I have seen work very well. And what this does is you are basically transferring the flexor tendon from the plantar aspect of the toe, and there's various ways you can do this, but then you're transferring it onto the extensor tendon or the extensor hood, and so you're essentially taking that intrinsic, or sorry, extrinsic that is causing flexion at the PIPJ and turning it um, so it's kind of pulling down from the top, so you're turning it from something that is causing flexion and extension in that area to something that is now straightening the toe. I have seen this work fairly well for flexible deformities. Um, Mainly where I've seen this work the best are people who get claw towing from an injury such as a, um, a calcaneus fracture or um, other kind of foot crush injuries, especially when you're getting it getting to them kind of early. Um, and then you can you can uh, perform this while they're still fairly flexible and it, it tends to work quite well. The reality is that as the flexible deformities don't seem to be quite as symptomatic, we're not seeing a lot of flexible deformities. It's usually the uh, fixed deformities that tend to come to us. Um, probably the most common um, action that we do is either a um, kind of a resection arthroplasty or a fusion of the um, uh, PIPJ for either hammer toes or claw toes. Um, and this can be done in various uh, fashions, but essentially what is done here, as you can see in this drawing, is the extensor tendon is released and opened, um, and then the joint is partially resected. Now you can, classically it was described as actually just resecting 
the distal part of the uh, proximal phalanx and actually leaving the cartilage on the um, middle phalanx in this region. Um, and the thought there was that you're allowing, by resecting the bone, you can kind of correct the deformity and get it reasonably straight, but that you're not completely straightening it, and so you are maybe leaving a little bit of flexibility um, in that joint, because if you if you sit there and watch your foot on the ground, your joints are slightly flexed at rest, and so completely straight is not a natural position for your toe. Um, so that's the thought behind this, and there are still a lot of people who do this, and I admittedly do this um, quite a lot. Um, this will sometimes involve resecting the extensor tendon, it will sometimes involve resecting the flexor tendon too, if they're contracted, and you can do kind of both of these, and then we usually will place a pin um, across the joints, sometimes across the metatarsal phalangeal joint, again, depends on the contracture there or not, um, to hold the toe straight. Now you can resect both sides of the joint and try to get a true fusion. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that, and we do that a lot too. Um, the benefit of having the fusion is that it'll correct the deformity that is there uh, permanently. The downside of uh, doing a fusion is it doesn't move, and so um, sometimes people feel like even a little bit of movement is better. So there's pluses and minuses. No one's been able to show definitively one is better than the other. What we do know is that actually obtaining a fusion doesn't seem to matter in terms of um, outcome, meaning that unlike fusions where we do elsewhere where a non-united fusion tends to be painful, for these people it's really about correcting the deformity. And if you're able to correct the deformity, um, then that improves their symptoms. So this is kind of showing, you know, doing a similar thing at the for a mallet toe. Obviously for a mallet toe, you can, the deformity is at the DIPJ, and so the PIPJ uh, can essentially be ignored, and you're doing pretty much exactly the same thing. And as you might imagine, if you have a stiff contracture of a claw toe of both of those joints, it would be totally uh, reasonable to perform this at uh, both of those joints. Um, in, in both of these, we're talking about using a Kirshner wire, and that Kirshner wire usually stays in to kind of hold the correction for the first four to six weeks, and is pulled somewhere at that point, either four to six weeks. Um, obviously, the problem there is that you have, don't have anything that's truly holding the correction anymore. You're kind of hoping for the repaired uh, extensor tendon, the repaired collaterals to hold your joint in place. And that isn't always the case, to be quite honest. And so for that reason, people have certainly experimented with internal fixation. Um, internal fixation um, has gone through various iterations. So it's gone through, you know, Herber type screws, headless screws, to these smart toes um, and other things. Um, and they worked. It has never have been truly shown to be that much better than Kirshner wires. Um, they probably are nicer and they don't have wires sticking out of your toes. But in terms of kind of holding correction or things like that, they're not that much better and they are definitely way more expensive. And the biggest downside to some of these, as you might imagine, is what happens if one of these breaks. The nice part about a fusion you do with a Kirshner wire is that if it doesn't fuse, okay, at least you don't have broken hardware to then deal with in the middle of the toe, which is what you're clearly seeing here. And this is this happens at a not insignificant amount of the time. And then obviously uh, this is really difficult problem to deal with if they have a lot of deformity. And that's why a lot of us don't do that as a primary, but there are a fair amount of people who do. And um, you know there are advantages and disadvantages you got to think about, but certainly an option. All right, let's move on to planar plate disruption. So the planar plate, this can really e either be a, an acutely traumatic event or a slowly degenerative event. Probably slowly degenerative is the more common. Um, people will have pain at the metatarsal, metatarsal joint, usually plantar and usually with activity. It's usually with kind of extending the toe when walking or running. Um, they can certainly get deformity of the toe at the metatarsal phalangeal joint, extension of the MTPJ, 
possible medial or lateral deviation if you have a tear in the medial or lateral side of the joint then you're going to get some deviation and if it's bad enough you can even get a crossover toe um, so this is some work that uh, Dr. Mike Hoffman did with a number of cadavers in um, Barcelona um, they actually dissected them and looked at the plantar plate to kind of look at the various types of tears and they saw a number of different types of tears uh, that can exist um, you can have central ones, you can have medial or lateral partial tears, and you can have full tears um, that rupture from the uh, proximal phalanx. And this is just showing kind of the deformity present. It goes from kind of a very mild medial deviation to a very profound um, lateral deviation to extension of that MTPJ to a, a full crossover toe. Um, and so in addition to just visually looking at their toes and like everything else you want to compare side to side the other important physical examination that should be done is a shuck test and the shuck test similar to um, an anterior drawer of the ankle or the knee or a lockman um, you really want to see is there excessive motion of that joint to where the normal check rein that the plantar plate provides which is against that extension is there and you really want to be sure to compare to the other side because um, obviously some people are more flexible than others and again you want to evaluate them all standing for deformity because sometimes this deformity cannot be as evident when people are sitting um, so this is actually a, a very early patient of mine it's a 52 year old woman um, had an acute injury after running um, and what you can see here it's maybe a little bit uh, present on the AP you can see that kind of weirdness at her uh, second um, metatarsal phalanger joint and you look at the oblique in the lateral you can see that she's just basically dislocated her uh, second toe and she had a complete rupture of her plantar plate of her second toe um, and so treatment for patients um, treatment for patients with minimal deformity is typically non-operative. Um, you can really try that initially. Even people with partial tears and maybe some medial or lateral deviation, like some minor deformity, um, you know, you can certainly try this. And this this will admittedly be the vast majority of people. So it starts, it starts with toe taping or strapping, stiff-soled shoes or carbon fiber insert to prevent that or restrict um, the dorsiflexion motion. And oftentimes a metatarsal pad to help offload the MTPJ um, and ease the pain that is caused at the joint because the joint will be inflamed. Obviously, if, if there's any deformity, rubbing and rubbing in shoes can be problematic as well. In terms of surgical treatment, um, it is possible to do a repair. Um, again, this is something that people have been doing for a long time. The what. Mike Hoffman developed was this kind of method of doing it dorsally. People have been doing it plantarly. Uh, the problem with plantar, as you might imagine, is you're walking on your scar. So wound breakdown and other problems um, do happen. Um, so in this case, uh, the joint is spread open with a retractor or a while osteotomy is performed. And we'll go over what a while osteotomy is um, in a little bit. A while osteotomy is essentially a uh, an osteotomy of the distal uh, metatarsal in order to uh, shorten it and help offload uh, that area. But when you do that in this case, it does give you very good visual access to the plantar plate. And then you actually look at the plantar plate and you evaluate it. Typically, if it's a partial tear, you'll then kind of complete the tear. If it's a um, full tear, you want to just make sure that you can find the plantar plate in order to do the repair. And then you do, there's kind of these uh, mini scorpions and little pigtails you can use to pass suture into that plantar plate. And then through bone tunnels, you're passing those sutures um, from plantar to dorsal through the proximal phalanx, um, close to the joint, but out of the joint. Um, and then you're securing those um, over the top of the joint with the toe in a slightly flexed position. Again, this is, you're kind of pulling that plantar plate back down um, onto uh, the proximal phalanx in order to allow it to repair. Um, and that's what I did with my patient that had that acute crossover toe. I did shorten her metatarsal slightly. Um, and then she did, she had a full rupture and did a plantar plate repair, held it down, and she actually did quite well. 
Um, so the last quick thing we're going to talk about today is metatarsalgia. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about, and hard to say this is more common than hammer toes, probably not, but certainly more annoying. So metatarsalgia is pain at the metatarsal phalangeal joint. It usually happens with walking or weight bearing. Patients can feel that there is a pebble or a rolled sock in their shoe, and they likely have some swelling at the joint. Um, and the joint pain is thought to be from capsulitis of the joint. Um, it is very crucial to do a proper evaluation um, because there's a lot of things that can cause pain in there, and you want to make sure that there aren't other causes that you're seeing that you could potentially address. But very commonly, um, no other symptoms are there, and it's just pain um, in that area. Um, it's really thought to be a capsulitis or just an inflammation of the joint itself, um, not necessarily associated with degenerative changes. Obviously, you can see arthritis and other things in that joint, but um, very often this is, does not have any evidence of arthritis. It's just inflamed. If you get an MRI or you get um, you know, a bone skin or something like that, you may see some slight edema, you may see some slight uptake, but it's otherwise fairly unimpressive on um, imaging and everything else. So treatment for this is almost always non-operative. Um, and it can be difficult, but for a lot of people, uh, it can be good as well. Um, so this usually starts with metatarsal pads, again, stiff sole shoes. You can do intra-articular injections, NSAIDs, activity modification, kind of all the things for inflamed joints that we do elsewhere. Um, and you really want to give people a number of months, like six months plus of trying this before you opt for uh, surgical intervention. And surgical intervention is really reserved for those patients who have failed this non-operative treatment and are severely impaired because the surgery itself is, results are good but not great. Um, and there are certainly patients who continue to have pain despite surgery or made worse. So the kind of mainstay of surgery for this is doing a synovectomy or trying to remove, remove the inflamed synovium, and then often doing either a while or other metatarsal shortening osteotomies. And there are a number of variants, but the while is by far the most uh, popular and used. And so the while osteotomy is a distal metatarsal osteotomy. It's usually made, made in line with the plantar aspect of the foot, as you can see up in A here with the saw. And what you're doing is you're going right at the very top or the very edge of the joint, making that saw cut and then allowing that head to then fall backwards. And it's usually shortening you know, anywhere from five to 10 millimeters depending on um, preoperative x-rays. And what you really wanna do is you wanna look and try to get it down to about the level of where the third metatarsal phalangeal joint is. So kind of down to the level of the third. Um, and then you kind of cut the overhang once you're done there, and then you'll typically um, secure this with one or two screws. The benefit of this is that it relieves the additional pressure that's happening through that joint, and it will, unfortunately, tend to redis redistribute the pressure elsewhere, so sometimes you can get transfer metatarsalgia when doing something like this. Um, but for people who are severely debilitated, uh, this is a reasonable answer. Again, it doesn't work for everybody, but a reasonable choice. All right, well, I uh, hope that was good. I hope you guys are staying safe and washing your hands. Um, if anyone has any questions or anything else, uh, please email me. Uh, all right, uh, you guys take care. Bye-bye.